Good evening. Welcome to Pushkin House. Um, my name is Kim Sassaman, I'm director of Pushkin House. And it's a great honour to introduce this evening's performance that's been organised in collaboration with the Anglo Russian Culture Club with Larissa Itina. Um, Larissa, thank you for organising this evening. It's been a great undertaking and um, we've been discussing it a long time. And it's um, a part of the Bloomsbury Festival this year. And the theme of the festival this year is, um, is activists and architects of change. And I need to recognise that, uh, like no one else, Teatro de Dork absolutely fitted in with this theme. Um, and um, Zariema Zaudino and I met in Tabos in Siberia in summer, in the middle of the night, um, at midnight, and discussed this. And I'm amazed that it actually came to fruition, so I'm very happy about that. Um, so, as many of you here will know, who you know about Teatro de Dork, um, one of the great tragic events of this year was the death of its founders, Mikhail Lugarov and Yelena Gromina. And uh, this play has been written by Zaryama, and it's, um, it's, about, it's based on their social media posts um, between 2005 and 2018. Uh, Zaryama um, is a protégé of Lugarov, and she trained and graduated from the Razbyeshkina Documentary Film School at the Razbyeshkina Ugarov Documentary Film School and she will be reading the final monologue at the very end after Sasha and John have left the stage. So um, the other two readers, apart from Zadiema tonight, will be Sasha Dugdale, a writer and translator who translated the play especially for this evening. This play was premiered in Moscow in September, but this is the UK premiere. Um, Sasha knew Gudomina and Ugarov well and worked with them closely over many years. Uh, she's also a poet, writer and translator and has just taken up a writer's residency at St John's Cambridge. She will be reading the play with John Friedman, a writer and translator and former theatre critic. Um, and uh, who knows more really about anyone in the English speaking world about, Rus about Russian theatre and it's a great honour to have him here, especially for this evening's event. So um, Sasha and John will begin the reading and it will be finished by Zarema. Thank you. It has begun. The Central Military Commissariat in Moscow burned down today. Tricky. The main task of the intellect is to refrain from imposing a concept. Sometimes I laugh about it with my assistant, Alia. She comes to see me with the usual pile of papers, the, one, the ones no organization can live without. We joke that one day we'll write a sitcom, a sitcom thriller, that is, with a title independent theatre in a new Russia. Theatre Doc is actually an independent, non-commercial theatre, and I'm the director. We borrowed our founding articles from Lubimovka, another non-commercial independent, and Lubimovka borrowed its articles from the very first playwright and director centre, which was also once an independent organisation. Alexei Kazantsev arranged and paid for those original articles. Kazantsev was the first person to show the world that a playwright could successfully run his own and our common business, made his memory live on. C.A.P. for three whole days. I barely lifted my eyes from the page. C.A.P. is what my kids used to call, call it when they studied it in school, crime and punishment. They also called it Dost and Fama Dost. There's a federal penitentiary bureau once called the Central Directorate of Punishment. We've written a few letters to them from Theatre Doc in our time. Sandrik says there should be a Central Director of Crime to match up. They should divide up its responsibilities between the Ministry of Home Affairs, Defense, the Tax Police, and give a little to the Ministry of Culture. I can think of three really critical points when I thought we'd have to shut the theatre. The first was when the owners raised the rent to 80000 a month, and wanted to back charge us 
a, complete, a completely huge amount. I remember how we had a fundraiser for the theatre and raised the money we needed and actually had a ball doing it, but it was a moment of pure horror. Someone made the rubbish joke that we needed renaming, not Theatre Doc, but <laughs> Theatre Pet. <laughs> the second horrible moment was when we changed electricity providers, moved from the state one to a cheaper one, and the state company sent down men to cut off power. We ran a cable from the lift shaft to give us power during shows. Ida ran herself ragged with one of the providers. People told us that they obviously wanted us to pay bribes. I can report with pride that we never paid bribes, not even to the fire inspectors. We just followed their inspection reports and did what they wanted. I have a difficult relationship with paying bribes. I feel it's only justifiable to save a life or for the sake of the health of the or for, or for the sake of the health of a loved one. Like the envelope of money you slip a doctor, your purse or your life. The way I see it, corruption is a social evil, and the person paying the bribe is guilty too. If you give money, then you've made your peace with the corruption which is killing us all. You haven't pushed back. Corruption is a brick, and if you pass it on, then it falls on the head of the person behind you. For that person, it's even harder to push back. The bribe taker is more confident. Kulia, tell you, that made me laugh. His comment on how to handle a certain theatre person grab them by the tail and bash them against the door. <laughs> and he also wrote, what fun it is to quarrel with everyone. Like my aunt who terrified the relations by saying with a radiant beam on her face, let the feckers fight it out. <laughs> but seriously, or rather not seriously, I was sitting in the kitchen smoking gloomily, talking about the problems with new drama. I formulated the problem as this, the limpets have attached themselves to the hull of our ship. Sandrik disagreed. He said the limpets were just the underwater crew members setting sail on their own journey. Yana Gremina added, but the underwater crew can't survive above water. Or the Mikhailova was interested. Why not? Did their eyes pop out? <laughs> the life of ideas is the most important thing about any person. Whether it's strong and expansive or reduced and restricted, it dictates what that person will achieve in art what he needs to feel satisfied. Basically, you need to be greedy to achieve a lot. Some are satisfied with one or two productions of their work, to be briefly on trend, or to have seven or eight followers. I don't know why I'm, reading this, why, why I'm writing this. It must have something to do with new writing. Verbatim in theater, etc. Tech Week. David Smolyansky, the producer. I just want to know when you'll have the set ready. Silence. Just to help me understand Silence. In a depressed voice, to understand is to forgive. We turned on the television at about 2, 3 o'clock for the first time. We didn't know anything. We were just a little surprised when the news wasn't on, just Swan Lake. We switched the television off, then switched it back on again a bit later. Tchaikovsky concert, then a choir concert, a cappella. That was already suspicious, according to Soviet folklore, or the cultural code of the time anyway. Poems were being passed around back then by Alexander Khmelyuk, I think. The poems were on the endless deaths of leaders. I woke in the dark, heard the telly playing bath. I was sure then at least another leader was deceased. I woke to the alarm, straight away I'm hearing Brahms. Brahms at dawn, what a racket, another leader kicked the bucket, and so on. <laughs> <laughs> so we knew pretty much what classical music meant. We knew something must have happened. <laughs> then the tanks on the streets, Echo Moscow, radio broadcasts, Anyone who went out to protest remembers it all well. Some people realized what was going on straight away, but we weren't as wise as them. My first inkling of the reality was in October 1993, especially after that letter signed by so many of the intelligentsia. I remember the exact feeling of misery I had when I read it in the Literary Gazette, that poisonous little letter addressed to top government and all the glorious names who had signed it the idols of my youth, asking not for pity for the fallen, not for reconciliation, but to deal with the already defeated in the best traditions of bloody Stalinist terror. I cleared out the computer, found 657 plays, counted them. <laughs> Contemporary morals. The way people relate to each other is changing too. Now a good friend will go into detail about sex with his wife, but would never divulge his salary. 
The latter becomes an intimate detail, an affair of the heart. Here in Columbia gave me a leather bracelet with studs on it. Can't work out where I should wear it to. Maybe to my first night at Kalyagin's theater. <laughs> I didn't want to, but they made me. They made me do something that felt totally inappropriate. Write a foreword to a collection of plays by Mikhail Ugar. Just say, as his wife, said the editor. So that's what I did. Nightmare situation. I had a sudden brilliant idea for a script for cinema. I'm sitting here at home and I can't tell a soul. Well, I could tell the family, I suppose. But apart from me, there are three other writers in the house. I'm scared they'll steal my idea. I've never, I've never ever had such mean thoughts that they might steal my ideas. I've always, I've always disdained such thoughts, believing absolutely that you should never ever steal. I'm not talking about a lighter or a Parker pen. But now I'm worried. It's the first thing that comes to my mind. The idea is just there for anyone to see, practically lying there in front of me. But it so hits the mark. How come no one's seen it before now? The performance of 1 hour 18 minutes, the trial that never took place, went surprisingly well, I think. There was complete and utter silence during the performance. Apart from the excellent cast, the audience clearly got the concept of the play, the villains justifying themselves. But what's interesting is that this production is different from our other documentary pro projects. One, it's the first documentary production that doesn't proceed from our house style of no position. The theatre supports the mother's accusation in the prologue, and this accusation is made against particular people, the whole system, and the indifferent. That's against us as well. Two, because most of the interviews for this project began with the words switch off your recorders first, it is nowhere near verbatim. The play is a documentary reconstruction, and it reconstructs an imaginary situation in which all those who, to a greater or lesser extent, caused Magnitsky's death are on trial themselves. Three, this is direct action theatre. I mean, we really want to make clear our thoughts about the way that, ways that defendants are treated, the corruption, the torture they're subject to. And we dream of helping bring about change in some way. Theatre is celebration. Met with Heifetz's theatre laboratory in the Theatre Workers' Union today. Talked about new writing and theater doc. Best bit of the discussion when a theater director the same age as me shouted, what, you mean you say you don't see theater as a celebration? Two centuries ago, the Moscow Arts Theater revolted against the doctrine of theater as celebration. Now the fucking idea has crawled its way back in. We see many terrible things and we turn a blind eye. But there are people who are trying to change things. Lots of stuff, maybe everything, seems very relative. Why should I think that Kasparov would make any better a president than Putin, etc.? Can anything be done to stop people drinking, or giving bribes to the police and everyone else just for the sake of a quiet life? <coughs> Evil is everywhere. There is just so much of it. Can we do anything about it? Many of my friends say that this is it, nothing will change. This all-present evil is a fact of life. But to give one example, they used to, rip, they used to rip out the nostrils of convicts in the 18th century. Catherine the Great signed a law and they stopped doing it. And they stopped quartering people and breaking them on the wheel. That isn't relativism. It's a genuine improvement, a reduction in cruelty. And there are people amongst us who have dedicated their lives to reducing this cruelty. The snow is melting out here in the countryside around Moscow. Whole fields uncovered in a single day. When it's melted some more, I'll take my black sack and my pickup stick and go and collect rubbish. I could hear the airplanes passing overhead at night. Shiremitova isn't far away. Once I was flying back from Frankfurt and I saw the bend in the East of the River and our dacha. Skvartsov just rang and asked whether he should sing at the closing ceremony of the Golden Mask Festival at the Bolshoi Theater. I said, definitely, it'll be an adventure. I'd sing in his place. <laughs> There's so much dust in the house, it's collected in balls. You open the door and the balls of dust roll in all directions. Today I destroyed them all. At long last, I bought some new bags for the vacuum cleaner. One of my favorite stories told to me like this. If you pay attention, you'll notice that most mad people are mad to their own advantage. In my whole life, I've only ever known one real madman, and that was the writer Yuri Alyeshev. He received a fee from the bank on Lavrushinsky once, and as we walked down the street to the cafe to buy a drink, 
He held his fee in his hand, a pile of ten rouble notes, and thrust the notes one by one through the windows of the basement flats, because he reckoned poor people lived in basements. By the time we reached the cafe, there was no money left to buy drinks. I wish us all the ability to be real madmen once in a while. <laughs> Family plus army equals demographics. Putin wants children to give them to Ivanov, so Ivanov can shove them in his army. Putin is the gray wolf from Yemenian's poem who comes out of the forest. He wants to grab our kids in his teeth. But on the other hand, there's something else that frightens me. All those women who would do anything for money, all those bitches, they'll be popping babies just to get Putin's allowance. They used to do it for flats in the old days. <laughs> Every day, someone hacks into the theater.org website. But those, they see it, mends it, and they hack it again. Today, the hackers put up a romantic photo of two naked guys on the homepage. It must be that for the hackers, or their bosses, a picture of two gay men is the worst humiliation they can think of. But one of our actors didn't even realise the sight of being hacked. She thought it was a new show. <laughs> on the subject of the eternal, a pine sapling has grown all by itself under the window of the dacha, about 15 centimetres tall already. I told Christina, my eldest daughter-in-law, that I wanted to get rid of the sapling. Christina, a devoted follower of Rousseau, shouted that it wasn't right to kill a living thing. But it will grow and block the window. It doesn't matter, we'll all be dead by then. Let's just remember that the state has no special state source of money for the arts. It's our money, the people's money, and those people include even the artist who rejects the state. Perhaps the next step will be to announce that only those loyal to the state will receive medical cover. I'm lazy and curious. It's honestly the worst. Worse than Pushkin had it, even. Greninna teases me that it isn't as hard for me as it is for my partners. But I think, if you're so lazy, how come you need to stick your nose into every little corner? If you're so curious, how come you don't care about the results of the things you started? And a question. Does anyone know how much it costs to hire a prostitute in Dostoevsky's time? <laughs> I would say, it isn't good to be obsessed by Putin and his regime. I tell myself this over and over again as I immerse myself in material for future verbatim shows, songs from our prisons, and the sequel to One Hour 18 Minutes. The evil inherent in the regime is not just about trials and repression, but the very things this repression is, is deflecting attention from. The end of financial support for the very poor, the collapse of the health system, sucking the lifeblood out of education, just destroying social protection, the ill discipline in the penal system, worst of all, a lack of political will to deal with all these problems. But it will be our defeat if we live our lives only in the spirit of opposition. The main thing, after all, is to say yes, yes to the fact we're alive, yes to the things we love the most important things for us. Hatred of the regime cannot be the main driver in our lives. Social documentary projects in theatre are a lifeline for me, real, defined tasks that can perhaps help people, children, teenagers, or those without social protection. I owe a debt to these people, as anyone who thinks like me does. Theatre Doc Evening. Tomorrow, that is, today already, there's a Theatre Doc fundraiser. Performances at 6 and 8 p.m. Here's a fact. People who couldn't possibly come also bought tickets. Those people included Alexander Kalyagin, Kirill Serebrenikov, Lyanna Nevezhina, Olga Galakhova, and others. Even curiouser, Alek Tabakov bought 25 tickets. Greetings on International Day of Theatre. I'd especially like to give thanks to independent theatres and those who work in them today. They work for love, and love rules the world. Our lives are hard. But whilst we're still on stage, loved by our dear audiences, this celebration is for us. Friends, remember the one rule of survival. Friendship is essential. Independent theatre can't exist without friendship. Friendship and love are our bread and butter. We can't do without them. Scandals and the clashes of great egos are only possible in the big theatres with their classical colonnades and the money to cope with all that. But we won't survive without love and friendship. Dear old Doc, I congratulate you. Thank you for being there. Thank you, friends. Yesterday I bought some roast chestnuts on the street, and today I couldn't go to the launch of the British Festival of New Writing. The chestnuts ended badly, an allergy and a high temperature. 
I'm stuck at home. What's the link between Mark Ravenhill and Rose Chestnuts? <laughs> Why is it that oblique connections give the effect of realism? Direct connections. <laughs> I don't know about all of you, but I had a successful morning spent in the fire inspection office signing as the director of DOC a protocol listing administrative infringements. Our new, new door is 110 centimetres wide, it should be 120 centimetres wide, and a whole lot of other annoying details which taken together make an independent theatre's everyday hell. And on the 25th of April at 10 o'clock, I'm even going to court, administrative court, Although actually, the fact that the penalty is in my name as director of DOC and not the organisations has really kept the fine low. I went to a rehearsal today, but as an actor, directed by Sportsov. I was about 40 minutes late for the rehearsal. This was to get revenge. He was always <laughs> late to my rehearsals. <laughs> he was once late for a rehearsal and ran into the room shouting, It's at a standstill! It wasn't immediately clear that he was talking about traffic. Then I asked him lots of stupid questions, parodying how actors behave at rehearsal. There's a whole list of stupid ritualistic questions which an actor has to ask the director if he has any respect for himself. They didn't get it, they didn't get it was irony. They answered me straight. <laughs> when we drove through Chen, the town, my mobile was responding to the reception, and when we turned into the village, it was looking dark, and a wild boar peered out at our car, a moose splashed past, and then a hare ran past. And then in front of the car, a baby owl appeared, the size of a tiny box. It flew behind us, checking whether we were worthy prey. I saw a frog today, a bit dozy, but still hopping along. And yesterday, a butterfly flew past the window. To start with, I thought I'd been staring at the computer for too long, and I was seeing things. But it was a real yellow butterfly, a brimstone, perhaps. I'm not sure. Theatre friends and colleagues, you don't have any spare stage decking, do you? We desperately need some. Six decks, two by one meters. We'll buy it if it's not expensive, or we'll happily accept it as a gift if that's a possibility. There are people who are utterly incapable of finishing a telephone conversation. They wait for you to help them out. <laughs> Some people are always doing home improvements. They can't seem to stop. Someone should tell them that enough is enough. Some people can't ever quite leave behind a relationship that is over. They keep waiting for something, waiting to be sent back in. They drag out the finale as long as they can. According to some, this is the fear of death. I'm thinking about how much I love theatre and how it helps me to live right now at a difficult point in my life. I feel for theatre right now the same gratitude and love that Sten Gorazin felt for the Volga River, only without the Persian princess. <laughs> Three days since I left Yasna Palyana, took until today for me to want to go back there, even a little. Until now, and all the time I was there, I couldn't wait to escape without any psychological damage. And back in Moscow, I just thought, thank God that's over. It wasn't bad there, but seven days of intensive interaction, the only break was the six, seven hours I got to sleep, by the end I was near hysterical. On the last night, we had a campfire in vodka. Everyone came. I wandered with a torch around the huge hangar. That's where the campfire was. And hoped no one would come and talk to me, because I couldn't have said another word. It was the middle of the night, but I didn't have the energy to go back to my room and sleep. I wanted to be with the rest. Afterwards, it turned out that lots of us felt the same. If I'm honest, it's my favorite game. I'm not here, but I'm here with you. <laughs> I had a bottle of vodka in my anorak pocket, but I really didn't want to drink. When everyone started shouting, vodka, where can we get vodka? I resisted the temptation to give up my bottle. <laughs> I reckoned that the next day we were doing all the final performances and another bottle could harm the proceedings. So me and the Kavarskaya dog, that is the dog that belongs to the Anna Kavarskaya, uh, a brindled dachshund called Suzo, we went out into the, the dark, right to the far corner of the hangar where the nettles were thickest. And we made a secret cubby hole in the metal pillar and I hid the bottle of vodka there. I thought to myself, in a year's time, I'll come back here and I'll find my bottle and we'll light the campfire and drink it. But then Kurochkin found me in the darkness and asked for vodka in such a pathetic voice. <laughs> so I had to go back into the thicket of nettles with Kowalski's dog and the torch. This evening, I wanted to go back. Reposting on the Musiim. In the crowds at Zamaskaritska Assizes, I saw a person who looked like my favorite teacher, the screenwriter Sandu Radionov. 
Whilst I was trying to get closer to him, he was dragged into a police van. It turned out it really was Sandrick. I didn't manage to say hello. I hope he's okay. So that's how I find out these days why my son never picks up. Anyone else got any news? Went back to the dacha. I haven't been here for eight days, and a red lily on the windowsill has flowered. I haven't got any eggs or Easter bread here. Does the red lily count as a painted Easter egg? Leanna says yes, of course. Sentencing for the Ballot Night Christmas. Bellows of two years and six months. Savior of two years and seven months. Zimin, Gutskiewicz, and Kulikovic, three years and six months. Praban, three years and seven months. Kruva, four years. All of them take into account the time they spent in jail as defendants. The Kainan suspended sentence. Good Lord, how horribly unjust it is. I can't even seem to console myself with the thought it could have been more unjust, more horrible. Boratino. Boratino's thoughts were little and empty, or something like that. I can't remember. That's me, that is. My thoughts get littler and littler. As soon as I feel a long thought coming on, emergency lockdown happens. <laughs> the husband has written words for a song. I've only been away for 10 days. Imagine if I'd been away for a month, what would I have come back to? <laughs> Songs about 14th of August, our lingering August. In August 1991, I went to Moscow and lived in Masha Arbatova's flat by the Olympic Stadium for a month. I was having an affair. And to help out, Masha gave me her flat and went to Ukraine on holiday with her husband and kids. It was a happy month. We hardly left the house only to get food. And all we ate was melons anyway. On the night of 19 August, I went out quietly and walked along the silent riverbank as far as Krasna Kristin's path. There was a curfew, and I was a little upset that the passing patrol cars gave me no attention. In my whole childhood, I only once got in a fight. I went to school number one in Arkhangelsk, and from time to time, they beat up kids in glasses. In those days, in the last century, boys in glasses were bullied, and girls never even wore glasses because their mothers told them it spoiled their looks. I wore glasses, of course, and we, the ones in glasses, won the fight. That's exactly how I felt in August 1991. Mm -hmm. And what happened afterwards to those boys in glasses never really bothered me very much. Everyone got what they deserved. Without warning, Moscow, the Moscow Property Department, has entered our <coughs> rental agreement without any reason. So if you like, or you're interested in theater, I said, our theater, I suggest you get yourself down to this historic, I'm not afraid to say that word, venue. And in case you're asking, yes, we paid all our rent and taxes on time. We obeyed health and safety regulations like the Holy Writ. But it seems like none of this makes any difference anymore. Yes, I did say at the opening of theater, Dr. New writing should die. I thought that was quite clear. But it seems I have to spell it out for a few people. Here goes. New writing is the result of a crisis. The movement was born out of an imbalance in contemporary Russian theater. When this imbalance disappears, then new writing will die. And I, for one, will be praising God when that happens. A proper balance between contemporary and classical texts needs to be found, but this won't happen anytime soon. Not because some evil people are keeping it down, and not because contemporary plays are shockingly bad and classical ones are still shockingly good. It's a question of a theatrical approach. It's a game in Moscow now. I don't know anything about theater doc and its problems, but there are lots of theaters in Moscow doing God knows what. And then Gremina, our theatre does God knows what. Sounds like an amazing creative approach. <laughs> Who the fuck bought a book by Aksana Rovsky? I just found it under the bed. 180 rubles. We, we won't have anywhere to live soon. I told them, buy a book, take two, and chuck them away. Pointless making a fuss. They'll only say they're keeping an eye on contemporary taste. Why do they need to do all this? Why can't they give a tenant 12 years in the space proper information, a reasonable amount of notice. But the fact remains that as a result, our colleagues have offered us their spaces with different conditions, but the same principle of generosity. Two powerful state-supported theatres in Moscow and St. Petersburg, two wonderful non-subsidized theatres, four collective art venues, three indie venues, three privately owned spaces in different parts of Moscow, one foreign theatre, I won't name names because apart from the Gogol Centre and the Marjani Shriya Theatre in Tbilisi, the other offers were all made by phone or message, but I am very touched. I still feel a sharp pain at the loss of our basement, but the support of colleagues and audiences restores us, touches us to the point of tears. 
We will find spaces for 15 current and 12 future productions in all those wonderful venues, and there will be a whole network of docks instead of one single theatre dock. If this is the way the government wants to play it, I doubt they foresaw that outcome. Yesterday, two state theatres in Moscow offered responsible venues for theatre dock. This is apart from Gogol Center. When I get back, we can discuss it. It's too early to list possibilities yet. I'm writing this because the help and attention of theater colleagues is incredibly welcome and wonderful. The feeling of loneliness recedes. As a result of yesterday's dirty jokes about zombies in the Duma, a small and nearly homeless theater was able to pay all its rates and debts and buy printed cartridges and things for living, like tea, coffee, and sugar, with the money from ticket sales. Thank you, dear audiences. Found Radio Culture online, so I had to listen. They have this program, Politics Free, where they talk about culture and art in a strange voice, as if they're talking to the mentally ill. <laughs> Another attempt to convince the population that culture is only for the nerds and misfits among us. But all of a sudden, the report on Politics Free Theater, I can't even think of a good equivalent, like petrol free tea. <laughs> where on earth did they find politics free theater in this country? Even the slogan politics free is political. The most servile, the most servile crap of all, arse licking before anyone has even asked you to lick their arse. When or oh, when will we learn not to put things off, to look after each other? When will we learn? According to the senior advisor to the head, of the Prosecution Department, of the Prosecution Committee, of the Prosecutor's Office of Russia, in the Primorsky area, Aurora Rome. Geez, can it be possible that a police official by the name of Aurora Rome actually <laughs> lives and works in Vladivostok? It's like something from bad play. Anyway, this Aurora Rome states that the defendant, a Primorsky partisan, has himself rejected the suggestion that force had been used against him saying he had made the former claim in order to escape criminal prosecution. It really is like something from a bad play. Yesterday, in the chemist, an elderly customer asked the chemist to take back a medicine she'd just bought. She hadn't realized it would cost 300 rubles. The dispenser explained to her that she had to take the medicine and she wouldn't find it cheaper anywhere else. The old woman wouldn't leave the shop. She kept asking them to take back the tablets and give her back her 300 rubles. The other customers got involved when they heard the conversation, and all the queue instantly decided to throw in a hundred rubles, some a bit more, some less. They gave this all to the old woman, but she didn't want to take it. She started crying, but they dropped the money and the tablets in her bag, and all together wished her a happy new year. <laughs> all this happened very fast. People seemed to delight in the communal response. It was good. Just amazed by what is happening at Theatre Dark right now. People in theaters are offering real support and shelter. I've never seen such a thing before. Our enemies and their art critics will get to see the art of resistance in practice. Theater docked will carry on, and a flying squadron is far more effective and dangerous for our enemies than any static group of partisans. Theater docked will be performing in nine venues across Moscow. We were one, and now we are nine. A little classical building on Moscow. A little classical building on Razgulyev Street between Balmanska and Krasnevarova. The wing of the building belonged to the Savin and Zakrivsky family. It was built in 1777. Inside, everything from the period is long gone. Only the walls and the facade are left. On the 25th of December, we signed the contract. This time, we aren't the tenants, we're subleasing the space. And yes, answering the endless questions, just as before, no one gave us the space. We searched for it ourselves with the help of audience members and we found it ourselves. We're paying the rent ourselves. I've got the keys today. Tomorrow, Saturday the 27th, we'll have a working party to get rid of the rubbish and clear the space. We'll let the public in to see the space towards the end of January and we have our opening night for the new theatre dock on the 14th of February. The faces of the policemen on Pushkin Square. Genetic engineering, I tell you. <laughs> Each man's mortality etched onto his face. They do it on purpose. They don't take the lowest of the low for the police. They take the ones who are even beneath them. To make sure there's strong motivation to beat people up with their truncheons. There'll be a film showing at Theatre Dock today. Our playwright, Maxim Kurchkin, is showing a Ukrainian documentary 
and there will be a discussion after the film. We are well within our rights, such showings are part of our legal activity. We're a theatre producing documentary plays, and we have the right to show documentary materials and discuss them as part of our professional activity. But we have information, as usual, all very Byzantine, that we could, could get a visit from the police today. This is probably rumour, but just in case, I'd like to ask any audience members and staff members who have a problem with documentary material to refrain from visiting the theatre. For anyone attending, a quick reminder that no violence is permissible, no swearing at anyone, no punching and so on. Any violence on their side will be in order to provoke us. Please stop others from being violent. This is the most important rule. Secondly, if the police drop in, the worst that can happen is a few hours in a police cell. Please document all that happens to you, as it's interesting, and you'll be able to tell your friends and later on your kids. <laughs> Thirdly, the only person responsible for all this is me, as I am the director and the only listed staff member in the theatre. The audience bear no guilt for what they see. You simply watch what we show you. After all, perhaps you have a critical view of the film. And fourthly, there is nothing to be afraid of. The police search, but wrong, that theater dock was a complete fiasco. They were carrying out boxes. I asked them what the search warrant specified, and they muttered something along the lines of, you'll see it later. I asked what reason they had for a police search, and they answered that it was a crime scene. What crime, I asked. They had no information that uh, a crime had taken place. So I asked what the bomb scare, evacuation stuff was about. All I got in reply was indistinct muttering. Clearly, that conversation had to come to an end. I asked them if they'd found the bomb. They answered, we found an object. What object they declined to say. Two lawyers came over very fast. Thanks to all of you who helped with that. Maxime, Sievin, and Stas were freed. I have the impression they're working out what they can blame us for. Their bosses haven't yet said. They removed the suspicious objects, a projector, a projector, two laptops, and a screen. Yes, and a camera crew from MTV arrived with the police and tried to interview us. My former students filmed as well for their own documentary project. My thanks to Nikita Shikinian, Alexander Vartanov for the support, hot tea, coffee, and food at the entrance to the Presinske police station. So there we are at 4 a.m. 31 December. I just can't get over how they broke and smashed the lighting for my show, 150 Reasons. And they smashed a little clay lid from the props. I can't help myself. Liana Gremina has been voted Person of the Year by the Association of Theatre Critics for her resilience. She's pleased, but wants to know why the prizes are always for resilience, and never for, <laughs> and never for capricious feminine willfulness, or constantly <laughs> changing her mind, or something. She'd like one of those prizes, too. <laughs> I think they keep out the shockingly willful and capricious sacking of one of the country's finest managing directors for a production that a court rule did not broken the law in any way, and to emphasize it's highly regarded by theatre critics. But for some reason, the opinion of a few priests who hadn't seen the show and the professional box of Alua is somehow of more consequence for our Minister of Culture than the views of Russian directors of genius. This is no joke. It's spitting in the face of all those famous great professionals who signed a letter in Ms. Lucha's defense. Just to remember you, just to remind you, they were Alek Tabakov, Mark Sakhara, Galina Vojtuk, Yevgeny Mirolna, Yevgeny Pusarov, Valery Fokin, and many others. Will you wipe your face and turn the other cheek, Russian theater? Or will there be some reaction to the fact that our Minister of Culture has spat in your face? Theater Doc had its bank account closed forcibly. Government officials find it hard to believe that neither the closure of a bank account nor the confiscation of the space will stop an independent and non-subsidized theater. We had 25,000 rubles in the account. I do hope that money will be used for tanks and airplanes to bomb something. So my guess is that this is how it works. Theater Doc is very much loved by the Presidential Administration, the Ministry of Culture, and the Traffic Police. A few days ago, they had the following chat by the photocopier. So, lads, how's our favourite theatre getting on? I haven't heard anything about it for a while. Nothing to report. May's coming up. Ticket sales are dropping. In this weather, people don't go to the theatre. They go off to their dachas. Well, we need to give them a hand. PR. 
How sweet little theatre dot, we must support the arts after all. There's nothing much to make PR out of, their version of Plato, or their production Silence, an evening without a single spoken word. <laughs> nothing much to shout about there. How about the Bologna case, they're busy rehearsing. Don't make me laugh, who cares about that stuff? Some tearjerker about how a mother misses her dear son and is waiting for him to come home from prison. Come on now, lads, we need to help them. We'll send the boys round tomorrow for the rehearsal. Only remember, Barman Spare's shut for rebuilding. There's a bus service from the other stations. But like we haven't got enough to do. Make the sacrifice, lads, for the sake of art. And the result, top news item on Gidemus to Interfax and so on, police crash rehearsals at Theatre Dorf. Thank you, all you dear men in uniform and plain clothes, dedicated supporters of Theatre Dock. We look forward to welcoming you back. Yes, we have also invited lawyers to attend each show, all at Theatre Dock. Police Academy meets Theatre Dock. First of all, some blonde woman came in and showed us her prosecutor's office pass. She had with her a dashing young emergency and rapid response policeman, who looked at the Ikea lamp and wrote in his notebook, lamp all wrapped in paper. <laughs> a third man, gray-haired, introduced himself as a specialist in solid waste for some reason. <laughs> then there was a policeman in plain clothes and one in uniform, then later two more, who had been hanging around the gate since the morning. One was from the violent crime department, a specialist in GBH as he introduced himself. And alongside him, like his shadow, was a person without name or rank who took quick photos of the playbills for the Bolotny protest play for Belarus Putin and the box someone left behind with Crimea is not ours, written on it. That man kept flattering me and then casually asked how we're celebrating Victory Day. Are we planning any more documentary film showings or plays about Ukraine? When I told him that on the 9th of May we were showing a free student show about the diary of Anne Frank, he asked if I wasn't afraid that the students might do something inappropriate. After all, said the man who wouldn't tell me his name. We all know what students are like. They interrogated me, all those people. That is, they chatted with me, and every one of them took away a copy of our sublease. In the yard outside, more men in uniform flashed about with files. They looked around the yard and read our playbills. The reason behind this police sellout one of them told our lawyer, was that there had been a big response online to the first night of the Bolotnik case the day before. A lot of articles, opinions, and responses. Well, I'm pleased. That's what we wanted, after all, to achieve something with the help of this show, to remind people about the, pro about the prisoners on the anniversary of the protests. And the police presence showed us that the theatre achieved that. Ray. I also, was, I also told that state security guy and the expert in GBH that Peter Dot wouldn't shut if they removed the organization's legal standing. We'd simply set up another organization to do it. Nor would we shout if they tore up our leasing contract. We'd open again, somewhere else. I, re I read rental ads all night. Good news there, hangers, barns, etc. are all much cheaper now. The first night of the Bologna case at Theatre Dock. Not everyone could get in the auditorium, but there's another performance on the 18th and the 22nd. The relatives of the men convicted were there, and there were lots and lots of policemen. They said they were defending us. <laughs> Quiet now. We're all home. Tomorrow we have to go to the police station. The news today. One, theater dock leasing contract has been withdrawn. We have four to six weeks to leave. In August, we'll be back to our usual quest to find a new space. Two, early, for me, Tomorrow morning, I have to go to the prosecutor's office as director of Theatre Doc. Three, I don't care about points one and two. I really don't give a damn. Four, in August, we reopen in the new venue. I don't know where, but I know we'll have five new shows. I went down to Theatre Doc for 6.45. The show goes up at 8 p.m. A bus of policemen was already waiting there, as well as several cars of plain clothes policemen. I was shaken. I didn't watch the show. There was no room. I drank coffee in the kitchen and smoked in the backyard. After the show, I said, right, enough. After this, we'll stick to Pinocchio. Ilya, Ilya Yashin replied, have you gone mad? If we do that, they'll get the whole state security. 
I'm going to strike for you, ha, 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 ha. That's what the dashing young emergency and rapid response guy joked today, laughing happily. The one who was here nearly two months ago on the 7th of May, the day after the Bolotner case opened. The one who wrote down lamp wrapped in paper in his notes for the search. He was joking away, looking at a new prosecutor's order, fining our organisation 500,000 rubles. You can find a small, non-commercial organisation, 14,000, or you can find it 500,000 and strangle it to death. I should say straight away that we are not planning to fundraise for this and definitely not to pay it. Our lawyer will appeal it, and if the appeal isn't successful, we'll just start another organisation. It only takes a week at most. So yes, if you hadn't realised, as we set up our new space and plan new shows and an Open Doors event, they continue to intimidate us and threaten us with punishments for offences committed in the space we've now lost. You have your strike and enjoy it, emergency and rapid response officer. You need your moment of fun too. Not about saving people for you, is it? Ha, 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 ha. At last, Hannah and Sandvik are home after a six-hour interrogation about theater doc. And I'm glad that I stayed home today because of my high blood pressure and rehearsed the five pretty girls in Yosha Zhivikov. <laughs> <laughs> today we said goodbye to our space in Rokhila. Five months and ten opening nights. Tomorrow we start a new stage in our life without knowing how long it will last. We'll live and work even more intensively in the wonderful yard between Pakrovka and the Garden Ring. A huge, huge thank you to all our volunteers and friends. We couldn't have done anything without you. I live in a house with two people of the year, Yana Gremina and Sasha Mindadze. Sandrik and I are hanging in there. To be honest, <laughs> this year has been cursed. Five years ago, everything has changed since then. This is the third theater space we've had. There was the basement on Trokrudne, the little house on Moskulai, and now two basement rooms on Mali Kazumne. But we're still in Russia, we're still in Moscow, even if the government don't want to see it. But who we'll ask them? We are DOC, we're together, and we're stronger than before, thanks to our audience and their support. As 2015 passes, I can only look back with gloom. But Yana Gremina takes a quite different view of it. 2015 was a victorious year for Theatre Doc. We found a space, we were chucked out of it after the Balotne case. We found another space. We're alive. We're working because we want to work. She's probably right. Her approach is much more productive than mine. What can we do when evil appears to win? Aliaksin who killed no one, who stole nothing, is sentenced to 20 years and is currently in a high security prison. Tomorrow, 23rd of September, we have a performance of War is Close, and one section will be dedicated to Aliaksin Sof. Please come. Information is on the website. If only to remember that this is going on. If only not to forget. A huge tree fell down across our street, right under our window. I got so excited. Bakhtin's the joy of story. Surely at my age I can't be starved of happenings. Tomorrow, we have a hugely important event. The opening night of our show, A New Antigone, dedicated to the mothers of Beslan. And hooray, we have the two heroines of the show, Ella Kasayeva and Emma Tavayeva, flying into the Majedeva from Beslan for the show. This show is unusual for us. It's nothing like the other documentary work we've staged. We use syntax and rhythm as our guidance to transform the documentary text into a play. The music of real speech. I always knew that documentary theatre was like music notation, and all of a sudden this knowledge was the key to the play. We don't think of a new Antigone as a show, but you can and should make shows about anything. We define a new Antigone as anti-theatre because it is cynical to use the language of theatre to talk about such a tragedy, but to keep silent is wrong too. Silence is complicit. We don't want to be silent and complicit. Theatre Doc is 16 years old, and I can't make out if that is a lot or a little. Age is a disaster anyway. You can be 70 and then 9 years old all in the space of a single day. If someone were to give me a model railway, I'd lay right down on my stomach and that would be it. A week you'd get no sense of me. How old does that make me? Theatre Doc is 16 years old. 16 years I've been director of this independent theatre. In 2002 I had absolutely no plans to run a theatre. 
I like my life, the life of a professional screenwriter and playwright. But as they say in fairy tales, you can't ask for it and you can't turn it down. It comes to you itself. And there it was. Did I consider that I would spend the next 16 years reading over leases, electricity bills, accounts, responding to, we're out of sugar, paper towels and print cartridges, being fined for no good reason, and latterly, to have a possible charge of extremism hanging over me and to sit through the stupid interrogations of time wasters in uniform. No, I hadn't planned any of that, and I would have been amazed if I'd known all that was to come back in 2002. And mostly, the anxiety every month of where to get funds, how to pay the rent and buy those cartridges. I wonder how many plays we put on in 16 years. I should count sometime. Being serious, Theatre Doc has managed a great deal in its 16 years. Back then, we were the only weird kids. But now documentary drama, community projects, new types of plays are put on in many different theatres, even the classical state theatres. And of course, we contributed to this. And lots of people who started out at Doc are now artistic directors, senior directors, leading playwrights in other theatres, and some of our stage managers and now well-known producers. Theatre Doc is a brand, it's a common noun. Lars Nietzsche recently described his film as Theatre Doc, but in the cinema. And it's not just him, and not just cinema. Theatre Doc is a whole new genre, and this genre exists independently of us, of the theatre. And we're always forging forward, trying out the new. The discussion dispute play when we came to power, for example. Themes, forms, actors and witnesses on the stage. And of course direct action theatre on the most pressing and taboo subjects. No Aesopian utterances. It's simply not the right time for insider speak. We call everything by its name on stage and we share these, our feelings and thoughts, with the audience. But I don't want to gloat about all this. Doc was conceived of not as a normal theatre, but a community. And this has been the case 50% of the time. And that's a lot. And sometimes I add into my motivation stuff like to change the world and to change our country. And sometimes, like when I'm at the police station, in some moments, even that happens. I want a lot. Some of what I want is still unrealised. I'm talking about the theatre here, not the country or the world. About the theatre, 16 years old today. The ability to commission plays, pay grants, send people on work trips. A larger venue where we could hold concerts and stage plays for a big stage. We're not in a basement theatre because we couldn't think any bigger than that, believe me. We think very big, but the rent on large spaces is impossible to find. I'd like to make the venue we have better, fit air conditioning and so on. I'd like to tour the theatre around the large and smaller cities of Russia. I know absolutely for certain that our plays are needed in those places. Who knows, maybe we will achieve some of this, but most likely we won't. We'll go on with this incredibly hard existence, in spite of everything, without any money or opportunity to grow, but with results. Even, dare I say it, victories. Although we definitely don't work for results. Happy birthday, dear Doc and our theatre community. You are unique. Thank you that we are all together in this. When you torture a person using electric shocks, you have to watch the current strength carefully because the twitching of muscles can make them rip and this can break bones. And those are clear indications. For the operator, the executioner, this is not good. There could be professional consequences. These are the little problems an executioner faces in his day-to-day -day work. We all know these little annoyances. I'm saying all this as we approach the presidential elections. Are we voting for torture and war? Lena, the police have just been round. They must have been sent to watch Ali's di diaries, but they ended up in the biggest space. Honestly, it's funny. They send policemen to a reading of the diaries of Ali Farouz, an oppositional journalist in prison, in the white studio, and the policemen get lost in the yards around Pokrovka and come to the other space and a YA performance about ancient Greek myth. <laughs> On the discussion of sadism in art college, I'm in favor. 
Have you noticed that people of middling and no talents are very hardworking, but the gifted? So here I'm in favor of sadism, torture and beatings, nothing else helps. <laughs> Marina Razbishkin and I talk about this a lot, because the worst sort of betrayal is betrayal of one's talent. You're given a talent, and then you're too lazy, or you haven't the time to use it. Alexander Korchin, because conditions worsen, it gets worse and worse. Poor, poor boy. I'm so sorry for him, his mother. He's guilty of absolutely nothing. Ten years. He's a hostage of something. But what it is, isn't clear. When you torture a person using electric shocks, you need to make sure that the current doesn't run down the left arm because there's a very dangerous loop it can make there around the heart region. The heart could stop and then you'd have a pile of forms to fill out and explanations, edicts, etc. There could be professional consequences. Best place is in the hip or leg. The lower loop, through the leg, is considered to be relatively safe, although all depends, I suppose. Life hacks in Russia, but we voted for torture and war. A court in St. Petersburg has called torture an essential tool. The St. Petersburg FSB has confirmed the use of torture. But you can't change reality. You can stand witness to it. We, in our theater, are staunch advocates of documentary and witness accounts. We call things by their names. We talk about the way war came gradually to the bus. We talk about chemical weapons attacks in Syria, and we put the case of Alex and Sov on the spotlight. Come and share all this with us. I'm not an oppositional type. Everything I do in Theatre Dark and everything I write may sometimes seem in opposition, but it's in fact just an appeal to adhere to a norm. I feel this is all that is worth doing. In our country, with its deviant government and its perversions at every level, an appeal to adhere to the norm can draw accusations of extremism. But we just have to keep on referring to this norm over and over. And if you do that, you'll become a revolutionary without even wanting to be one. Here's a picture of the police jail in Penza. This is where FSB men torture people. During torture by electric shock, people incriminate themselves and give names. They make confessions. A delightful detail. Before torturing people, the victims get a medical check. Blood tests, x-rays, any health complaints? How caring. In fact, it's, all it means is that the person is healthy. You can torture him. At the same time, another load of spy rubbish in London, poisoning to some mysterious poison. And the result of all this is the British Council in Russia closing down. You need to realise that all this is connected, and, and not just this. And at the same time, in Beauty Dot, we can't stay silent because it isn't right. Silence is a sign of complicity. We are against torture and against the way that the secret services increasingly define our lives. The FSB officer always achieves his goal, says the FSB officer, torturing some poor guy in Penza. And yes, in 10 minutes of torture, the lad is broken. They count on this. Let's keep saying it out loud. Power in our country has been grabbed by the secret services, and we don't know why they do what they do or what they do, but the pain of electric shock torture is unbearable. Tomorrow, 18th of March, election day, we have an event at Theatre Dock called Vote Against Torture. On the stage and in the auditorium, we'll have people who know all about the workings of the FSB because they have directly experienced it. Please come. Free entry. You'll meet some incredible and unique people, former prisoners, a girl from the Public Oversight Commission who recorded Filinkoff, the anti-fascist protester, describing how he was tortured. She is coming specially for this event. Spent the evening in the Sosna and Deepa Club, a hellish hipster joint. This one guy, a journalist, recognized me. So he says in a half coquettish, half rueful way that he now works in the presidential administration. A smiling friend of his came over and recognized me too. He said, hope you get a short sentence. I don't know if that was directed at me personally or if that's simply the sort of joke they make at the presidential administration. I don't want your condolences. We were very, very lucky to have met. It could easily not have happened. We're too different. But I was lucky just that once when I was traumatized and unhappy, incapable, as I thought until we met, of personal happiness. I met him and we knew each other and we knew we wanted to be together. I'm lucky 
I read what he wrote and I almost couldn't believe how much I loved it. I saw him putting shows together. I couldn't quite understand the magic he had with actors. That our sons from our former marriages became part of our new family. That we made theatre dock together. And in that, I was not the only lucky one. He changed people's lives. He supported them. He taught them. Lucky, too, to have had almost 25 years together with him. In September 2018, it would have been our anniversary. And he kept saying, 25 years, impossible. Who lives to see 25 years together? And he didn't. We didn't. It was so good. But such goodness doesn't last forever. Очень повезло, что мы встретились. Этого могло и не быть. Мы слишком разные. Но повезло мне раз в жизни, мне травмированному, несчастному, неспособному, как я думала тогда, до этой встречи, к личному счастью человеку. Я с ним встретилась, мы узнали друг друга, решили быть вместе. Повезло, что я прочла то, что он пишет, и не верила своим глазам, так мне это нравилось что видела, как он создает спектакли, и не могла понять, в чем магия его работы с актерами, что наши сыновья от первых браков стали семьей нам и друг другу, что мы вместе делали театр «Дог», и это, наверное, повезло не только мне. Ни одному человеку он изменил жизнь, научил, помог, что мы вместе почти 25 лет. В сентябре 2018-го должно было быть И он мне все время говорил, не может быть, что уже 25, столько не живут. И правда, не живут в нашем случае. Так хорошо, как было, не может быть навсегда. Uh, uh, about helping 
съест вообще все и выкопал еще и подвал. He, he uh, knocked down pretty much everything inside and also made a, a basement space. Он придумал очень классный проект нового дока. So he came up with this new uh, project of arranging a, a new Zed dock. И в эту субботу у нас окончательно снос вообще всех стен и начинается стройка из заново. And this Saturday, this coming Saturday, uh, uh, so they're knocking down the few walls that are left and, and uh, they're starting like the building works. И новая площадка откроется 1 декабря официальное открытие. Uh, the official day for the opening of the new space is 1st of December. И там огромное количество проектов, фестивалей, премьеры, причем как uh, молодых авторов, так, так и тех, кто начинал в доке, вырос и сейчас возвращается. So there are lots of plans already and, and there are lots of shows uh, um, scheduled, uh, both written by uh, very young playwrights, but also by the writers who are well established now and who were at the beginning of the very first theatre talk. So like his grandparents. We don't choose not to do theatre, but we will have a series. Издательская серия, где мы будем издавать драматургию, которую в России не издает никто. Они также придумали проект публикации, поэтому они планируют опубликовать эти статьи, которые не опубликованы в России, но в других издательских домах. А двухтомник книг Гремина и Угарова будет издан в ГОГО при поддержке Золотой Маски и будет высылать презентован. And uh, uh, this coming spring, uh, next year, um, there's going to be a presentation of the two volumes of uh, Graham and Nogaro um, works written. Um, I understand that Graham is responsible for doing most of the financing мы пока не очень понимаем, то есть у нас сейчас есть финансовая поддержка от фонда Михаила Прохорова, от СТД. Yet uh, they they do have some support, financial support from Prokhorov uh, Foundation and from um, a theater union. И нам даст это какое-то время научиться жить финансово самостоятельно. So this this kind of support will um, uh, provide us some time to learn how to survive. Потому что сейчас стало понятно, что временно писала сценарии сериалов и мюзиклов, и эти заработанные деньги вкидывала в дом. Because uh, now this has stopped, it became clear that um, Lena Gremina was um, writing scripts for like TV and series and stuff, and, and earning money, and, and then investing it in, in theater. So basically, documentary theater has got uh, other. Uh, it's a, it's a genre that's got sub sub genres in it. So there's verbatim, and there is kind of um, documentary theater that, that edits and, and is not verbatim. So if we're talking about interviews, like we, we get material and then we edit it. And, and if we're talking about verbatim technique, uh, then we do ask actors to um, imitate as, as, as precise as possible the uh, interviewee and, and uh, yeah. So basically the actor takes this um, zero position or, or no position um, of just transmitting the, the actual person that they interviewed. I was wondering what was the decision behind not having any dates? So I, I realized that there were two you know, the 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 days. days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Просто у нас есть промежуток, ага. ну, который я обозначил. 2005-2018. So they basically took the, the time frame, uh, so 2005 until 2018, and, 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 and uh, we just thought that uh, putting in like dates and, and introducing like chronology into it would like overcomplicate and, and uh, sort of distract from, from the, the dramaturgy or the, the story that's been built into it. What social media sites were these written on? And my name is that we stay for that one. Live journal and Facebook. They are all public, we all saw them online. No, none of them were taken off the internet. Are you not using the internet? No, they are not deleted. They are not deleted. They are and these plays that Ugaris referred to, 657 plays that he found, and I imagine by the time he died there were probably more. Is anything going to be done with any of these plays? Ugaris is a computer and I saw that it was just a chance to visit it. И, наверное, уже не больше у него там появилось. Они это какие-то не сделаны, то есть или... Это не его пьесы. Это пьесы были одних авторов, которые он вычитывал, отбирал, работал. There was a particular cemetery which is for theatre people or for people who are quite um, sort of elite. And um, as a theatre director, it might be seen as kind of obvious that he would be, be buried there. But um, I believe that the Moscow government at first refused and then said that there would have to be some payment, which wouldn't, isn't usually, it's like, as if you, if you wanted to just go there and have a free of choice. And that payment was a ridiculous amount. I think it was about, equivalent about 12,000 pounds in the initial money. Like um, but that money was raised within the day, and, um, and he was buried in this, in, in this cemetery. Then the Moscow government said that hadn't been true. I don't know whether they took that money or not. Yes, so they 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 refused to. So for both uh, for both graves, um, uh, Mikhail and and uh, Gremina, um, that they uh, were refused to be buried uh, for free. So they asked for money. The money has been raised by people and paid, and of course when they proclaimed that no, you know, we didn't ask for any money, no money was returned. <laughs> Did I get buried there though? There's Pokharani. How was this play received in Moscow? So the display was only read once, uh, and it was at a festival called Lyubimovka, which is a new writing festival that uh, Gremlin and Lugara started. And, what and it was the first uh, uh, year that this uh, festival was uh, happened without them being there. And there were a lot of people who couldn't fit into the, the auditorium. Most of the people who were in the audience uh, uh, knew them personally, uh, more or less well, and it was hard uh, to listen to all of this at once uh, and, and yeah, to kind of realize how, how, you know, what they lived in. Was that 
куда это приезжают там на спектакль по чеченскому правозащитнику? They, they were there at the, uh, at the previous reading uh, about uh, the uh, guy who was uh, defending Ch Chichen um, uh, kind of right uh, and rights. Uh, and then they came to, to the wrong, to the wrong uh, uh, studio space. <laughs> And the main, the main anxiety or fear, you can call it, is is the uh, <clears throat> the anxiety of not doing it well because the standards have been set up so high and by such uh, big uh, personalities that we are we are not as big as they are they were and we we may not be okay. able to. That, uh, and, and having uh, police somewhere hanging around, uh, we kind of got used to this. Thank you so much for uh, Larissa, for Pushkin House, uh, for um, inviting us here because uh, for people, for the community of the Doc, it is really crucial uh, at the moment to um, make sure that more and more people get to know about um, Grimm and Nogara and about them being really big artists and how they were um, how they were pressured and how they were finally killed by that pressure. And so thank you so much for, for Sasha's translation. Sasha Dagdale and John Friedman are the friends of Grimm and Ungar, who have divided their huge number of work to read this text. And uh, uh, both Sasha and John are uh, uh, friends, um, uh, were friends uh, with Lena and, and Mikhail, and they are busy people who thought that it is a priority to come here and to do this reading and to do the translation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming here. And, and now you, you know that there were these um, two great people. <coughs> Спасибо.